So today, I wanted to welcome you, Art116, and talk a little bit about um, uh, depth and distance and the illusion of space in a, uh, in a composition. We were able to um, begin with the idea, the study of plastic color to kind of uh, get a sense of what plastic color can do to create three-dimensional space in a two-dimensional uh, illusionistic, a two-dimensional space gets, you know, with three-dimensional illusionistic effects. Oh my gosh, this has been quite a day. So today I wanted to just expand a little bit about that. I usually do another project about this stuff, but, you know, because the, uh, my favorite magazines, all the fashion magazines have been kind of suspended or discontinued because of the pandemic or because they've gone on a business or something, um, I would usually um, assign this as a collage project to cut and paste things in the magazine from a magazine into a collage, but I don't think I'm going to do that today. I've only got two weeks left. I think I'm just going to do um, a wrap it up kind of a lecture about this today, and then we're going to move on to our final project, which is crazy color. Everybody likes crazy color. So that'll be uh, kind of a fun way to, to wrap up the quarter. So let's get to it, shall we? I'm just going to plunge right in here um, to my PowerPoint. Is there anybody who has a question or comment before I get started? I'm sure welcoming you know any kind of a question, comment, or concern that you might have about the last project or about you know anything that you see here. Here we go. Oops, I can't do that. I have to share screen. There we go. So we're going to share the screen, this guy right here. Okay. All righty. And then hopefully it will populate to your screen pretty quickly. So I have a cute little PowerPoint to do. And it's not the best PowerPoint in the world, but it's mine and I like it. And so we're going to do that. So I want you guys to just kind of briefly look at chapter eight. And I don't know how you could not look at chapter eight because it's kind of a cool chapter. It really talks about space and creating depth. We're touching on it in chapter seven in our look at color, but chapter eight goes into a lot more detail. So if you're more interested in painting, if you're kind of interested in what happens with photography and some of these um, optical things that happen with creating a sense of depth and space in a composition, look at chapter eight. There will be a, a couple of uh, concepts in chapter eight that I'm going to include in the quiz at the end of the quarter, our final quiz, 20 questions, which I'm going to cover today. And so today we plunge ahead. We plunge forward. And why is this not letting me go forward? I don't understand. There we go. So space, the final frontier. Um, there's two kinds of perspective, basically, that's talked about in chapter eight. The first is atmospheric, blah, 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 atmospheric perspective. And this is a kind of a perspective that's used by painters for the most part in landscapes, painting the natural world, but photographers make use of it too. And, it, and it's about what's in focus and what's not in focus and all of the rest of that. So let's talk about this for a minute. This is something that we started with our um, plastic color project last week. Um, we're creating the illusion of depth um, and atmospheric perspective does it um, using diminishing size and overlapping shapes. Larger, si larger shapes are in the foreground, smaller shapes uh, diminishing in size are in the background and sometimes we're overlapping the larger shapes over the smaller shapes to kind of help give a sense of um, space and uh, space receding into the background. And atmospheric perspective also definitely uses the plastic color rules. You know, objects in the foreground are large. They have bright colors and they are also sharply defined in their features. They have contrasty details and all of that stuff, the bright colors, sharply defined contrasting details makes them advance towards the viewer. They pop when they are in the foreground of the composition. Whereas objects in the background are small, they're usually made up of neutralized colors with fuzzy details, 
And that makes them recede into the background, pushing them into the depths of space and away from the viewer. And that push and pull of objects in the foreground and objects in the background is what really opens up our sense of three-dimensional space in atmospheric perspective. Now we're gonna look at landscapes today to really help to illustrate the idea of atmospheric perspective. But also we have to look at linear perspective a bit. And some of you have run across linear perspective in an art class in high school or other places, uh, internet discussions, whatever. Um, linear perspective is usually thought of as happening with geometric forms like building interiors or exteriors, cityscapes, roads, that kind of thing where you have um, regular geometric forms, especially rectangular and square ones where you've got parallel lines or things that are understood to have parallel edges and sides to them. So linear perspective creates the illusion of depth using diminishing sides and overlapping shapes. Hey, wait a minute, that sounds a lot like atmospheric perspective, and it is, but the, we are using linear perspective rules in linear perspective. So the edges of objects are understood, or the edges of objects that are understood to be parallel, like buildings, um, the sides of buildings, the top edge and bottom edge of a building are kind of understood to be parallel. They're understood to be large oversized um, rectangular solids, basically. But um, these edges tend to converge as they recede away from the viewer in space. Um, extended to the background all the way to the horizon line, these lines tend to converge on a point on the horizon line. And um, we, you know, we kind of refer to those lines that extend back to the horizon line to a point as orthogonal lines, lines that are used to construct a, um, a linear perspective. And I'll go into that a bit more. The viewer's eye level in linear perspective is level, level with the horizon line. Actually, your eye level is always level with the horizon line in any painting or photograph or anything. But where the viewer's eye is in the composition means uh, it, it really determines whether you are looking down at an object from up above or whether you're looking up at an object from down below or whether you're looking straight into the object. And so we're gonna see different kinds of perspectives, um, problems that that creates uh, for the artist and for the viewer. Okay, that was a lot of talk. Your authors first introduce us to something called intuitive perspective, which is like, it's an attempt at linear perspective because we have a somewhat understanding of how li uh, linear perspective works with the individual buildings or with individual um, uh, geometric forms, but we don't have a consistent throughout feeling of that linear perspective that kind of helps to unify the composition. So in this allegory of bad, good and bad government by Lorenzetti, it's a, it's a uh, fresco uh, from around 1339. And so, you know, this is before the Italian Renaissance. This is at the end of the Middle Ages in Europe. And artists are getting increasingly a better understanding all the time of perspective. And he's applying every trick about perspective that he knows so that he can tell us that um, sides that are moving away from us um, tend to have, you know, edges or uh, uh, features that are kind of on an incline and that kind of move back away from us a little bit. But being able to um, have a really well unified sense of linear perspective doesn't come until the Italian Renaissance. It happens about 200 years later um, as the artists and um, scientists, observers, really carefully observe um, how the natural world works and assemble this set of laws and rules that kind of work with linear perspective. So this is intuitive perspective. We're gonna to get to linear perspective in a bit. But of course, first I have to go someplace else, atmospheric perspective, because this kind of builds on the color, the plastic color principles that we were working with last week. So in um, landscapes that deal with a vast uh, 
uh, sense of depth in the composition. You know, we have objects in the foreground, objects in the middle ground, and objects in a far background. And the artist treats them differently with color and detail. So objects in the foreground have much more pure saturation of color, um, much more um, full chromatic color, um, full spectrum intensity color in the foreground. We've also got greater um, contrast in the foreground between lights and darks. And so we've got really, really deep shades and shadows in the foreground. And we've got bright, bright highlights in the foreground. And so we've got that high contrasty thing happening. We've also got details that are sharply defined details. And part of the sharp definition of those details is the contrast between different kinds of light and color in the foreground. So all of that gives us sharply defined details, lots of visual interest, makes these objects pop towards us in the foreground of the composition. In the middle ground, as we move back in space in the composition, the details tend to be softened a little bit. We don't have quite the definition that we do in the foreground. We don't have the range of, of uh, color intensity that we do in the foreground. The colors are becoming more muted or neutralized. But there is still some contrast between some things in the middle ground. It's just not as sharply, starkly um, uh, depicted as it is in the foreground. When we go all the way back to the um, horizon back here, we can see that the sky and the landscape are very similar to each other. They're both very grayed out. Any colors that might be you know, in the background have been neutralized quite a bit so that it's very smoky, very neutral colors. We are looking through an ocean of atmosphere at the background and all of those colors get kind of uh, filtered through an ocean of atmosphere that we're looking at, hence the name atmospheric perspective. So our clouds are predominantly gray, shades of gray, and our background colors are predominantly shades of gray. And that's what gives us that great sense of depth in a composition. Um, Thomas Cole was one of the um, uh, Hudson River uh, school of uh, landscape artists in the uh, early half of the 19th century. The Hudson River School were uh, artists who were kind of working out of New York, New York City, and going up the Hudson River and painting landscapes and kind of exploring this idea of, um, well, uh, color, plastic color, and, and creating these ideas of these vast landscapes. Um, some of the Hudson River School painters moved westward with European expansion during the middle of the 19th century. And as, uh, you know, settlers uh, moved westward, um, it was really interesting to document the brand new landscapes, the huge vistas, the inspiring uh, views that were out in the west. And so here we've got an Albert Bierstadt piece from about 1868. Now we're after the Civil War already and going all the way out to California, but here we are. And again, he's using things you know, in a similar way. The idea of contrasts in the foreground and sharply defined details. Even though our light source is in the background shining towards us so that we don't have a lot of light directly shining onto objects in the foreground. We see a lot of foreground objects in silhouette. Still, they are sharply defined in terms of edges and contrast and stuff like that. As we move into the middle ground, we lose a little bit of those sharply defined edges and details. And some of our color is lost too. Then as we move back into the background, the, um, the color continues to become neutralized uh, we've got lots of golds and browns, you know, in these uh, cliffs. But as we move back into the further, further reaches of the mountain peaks and up into the clouds, um, the neutralization of colors continues so that these colors are nowhere near as contrasty as the ones in the middle ground or the ones in the foreground. And again, that's how these landscape painters create 
the uh, the illusion of depth in space and uh, show these grand vistas uh, to the viewer. Um, it's not only in Western civilization and in, in Western culture that this happens. Here's a, a Japanese painter. Um, I'm, I'm hearing some things in the background. So I'm just gonna check back in with you guys to see if you're all still here and you are, and nobody's saying anything in the chat. So I'm going back to my screen share, back to there. Sorry about that. So even in this view of Mount Fuji by Utagawa Hiroshigi, we see the same thing. Um, much more uh, contrasty details sharply defined in the foreground in all of these waves crashing on the beach. And then on the shore, we see, because that becomes middle ground, um, a little bit less contrast and a little bit less um, uh, full, uh, full chroma color used in the background. And then we tend towards browns, which is a neutral, in the background. And finally, we turn, go into the grays, the, the light blues and light grays of the far distant background. And really Mount Fuji here is, it, it kind of collapses the space a little bit because of these um, well-defined um, contour lines on the slopes of Mount Fuji. Um, that, that tends to pop it back, you know, closer to the middle ground. Otherwise, um, the mountain going up into its snow cover up in the upper half of the mountain is very similar to the sky that is kind of blues and uh, grays in the bottom of the sky going up into kind of white um, in, in which is also a neutral, you know, a little bit higher up in the register here. So that's how we plunge from uh, things that are in the foreground through the middle ground and into the background in that composition. Let's see, I got it. Even in Chinese painting, it's the same concept. You have sharply defined and brighter color combinations in the foreground moving into the background. We have less well-defined details and more, much more neutralized colors moving into the background. Okay, you guys get the idea. We'll talk about linear perspective now because linear perspective is a different set of tools than atmospheric perspective for creating a sense of depth in a composition. And this is something that, you know, the, the Italians in the Renaissance really did um, uh, codify through careful observation. Um, they really observed like scientists and tried to figure out how light and objects were behaving as they moved away from the viewer's eye. Um, Leonardo was one of the most observant of them all and one of the most famous. So this is Leonardo's um, Last Supper, which you may or may not have actually known is a fresco painting on the wall uh, in a monastery, in the refectory, in the dining room area of the monastery where the monks would all be eating dinner. And so all of these spectators down here would be where the diners would be in this dining room, looking over at this wall where um, Jesus is uh, celebrating the Last Supper with his apostles in this interior space. And then we've got a wonderful schematic drawing that kind of breaks it down for us over here. So Jesus is in the center of the composition, and we can see a horizon line kind of going at the same level as his eyes and through his head, um, as viewed through the windows in the back of this hall. So that's our horizon line, basically. In linear perspective, we try to find um, these orthogonal lines that we can then organize our composition around. And so the lines that make up the details of the coffered ceiling, this is a way of making a little bit lighter seated ceiling by having kind of crisscross beams running through the center of a large hall, a large expanse, a large, a large span uh, that doesn't have any posts in the middle of it. Uh, we also have some tapestries you know, on the wall here, and they're all understood to be the same size, and they're all understood to be hung at the same height on the walls. And we can see how they diminish in size as they move away from the eye into the distance. Um, we can see that the, the tops of the tapestries are all aligned up on one of these orthogonal lines that kind of comes all the way down to this vanishing point that happens right behind the head of Jesus here. So basically, he's the center of the composition, and everything is also radiating out from him compositionally 
too. So all of the, uh, the beams in the coffered ceiling are also follow, following orthogonal lines that when extended all the way down to the um, vanishing point, uh, pretty much uh, come together behind his head right here. Um, so that's, that's kind of how one point linear perspective works. Um, one point single point perspective has a point on the, oops, <laughs> on the horizon line where um, all of the sides of an object kind of, if they're extended in space up through an orthogonal all the way back to that point, they would all come to um, converge at one point on the horizon line. That is if the, if the object is square or rectangular and all of its edges are understood to be parallel to each other. Even the ones that are moving away from us that look like they're converging to a point on the horizon line, these are understood to be parallel edges receding back into space. And so that's how that happens. Now your position in relationship to the horizon line is very important because the horizon line is supposed to be your eye level. And so if, you, if there are objects appearing above the horizon line, they are floating above your eye level. So you're able to look up at the bottom of objects and see their bottoms, but you can't see the top of that object because your eyes are down below the horizon line. And so you know, you're looking up at this wonderful floating flying box here. Here's an example of your eye level uh, being the same, but the placement of the object in the composition has changed. So now this box has been drawn below the horizon line. And so you're able to observe the top of it, like a tabletop or the top of a box, and the sides of the box. And as a matter of fact, we're seeing this two-point linear perspective edge on. So instead of having a broad side of the box being presented to us, we have the corner of the box presented to us almost like the bow of a ship. And so the sides of the box are receding away from us equally um, towards two vanish, two points, vanishing points on the horizon line. And the orthogonals are used to construct the edges of that box as it moves away from us. And so this is the illusion of a box in space as captured in two-point linear perspective. Um, and you're able to look down uh, and see the top of this box, but you can't get underneath it and see the bottom of it because your, your eye level is the same as the horizon line. And so it's, it, there are this wonderful set of rules about linear perspective. Okay. And so we've got linear perspective again in an Italian Renaissance painting here. This one is by Raphael, um, another one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And in fact, all of the turtles are in this composition. This is called the School of Athens. It's a fresco painting um, in the Vatican. Um, and Raphael was commissioned to decorate um, the walls in the Vatican Library. And so he thought that he would do a literary theme uh, dealing with the uh, um, philosophers of ancient Greece. And so in the middle of this uh, space, we have the two main philosophers uh, of ancient Greece, Plato and Aristotle, um, having their dispute you know, having a lovely little conversation right here. Um, uh, I believe, which is which, I think Aristotle is the bald one with the beard and Plato, I believe, nah, I can't, well, is the younger one with the, with the brown beard. Not exactly sure. It's interesting that in this created architectural space, and this is a fantastical architectural space, it's uh, churches and, um, temples and that kind of thing in the Renaissance didn't quite look like this um, because this is even more grand, more elaborate than what was going on architecturally at the time. Um, the horizon line is right here between the two main philosophers. And it's like your eye level is right at the bottom of this archway that is at the back of this long hallway down here. So right about where my pointer is here is where the vanishing point is for one point linear perspective that is used to generate all of this architecture. So this coffered ceiling, this very complex coffered ceiling with its hexagonal coffers interspersed with square coffers on a round vaulted 
um, uh, ceiling vault here with a dome in the middle and then another transverse um, ceiling vault back behind it. All of this comes down to converge at this one point, this one vanishing point right here on the horizon line, as do all of these kind of secondary um, ledges and freezes and those kinds of things. They're all converging down here at this point. All of the tiles on the floor down here are all still drawn in the same way, one point linear perspective, all converging back to this point. Whoops, right here. Don't touch things, James. Why do you touch things? I'm sorry. I have to go back and finish my screen share. This is so scary. So where are we? We were down here. Okay, let's, let's go down there and turn this back on again. Ah, come on, you guys. I want to go all the way back down here. Ah, there we go. So, um, you know, the point was that all of these all of these lines, all of this architecture, all of this geometry is pretty much based on a, a point of convergence on the horizon line right here in the whole composition. Now, um, we not only have a whole bunch of uh, philosophers from ancient Greece here, great thinkers all, but we've also got some contemporaries to um, uh, Raphael here too. Um, this brooding guy down here is actually Michelangelo. It's kind of a portrait of Michelangelo, uh, the sculptor. And so we've, we see Michelangelo with his kind of um, bowl cut haircut and, and beard. We've got, um, I think this wants to be Donatello, but I thought I thought that Leonardo was in here someplace. So anybody who's kind of got um, a bald head and long hair and a beard, I think this might be Donatello and the and a little bit earlier um, uh, Renaissance sculptor and another teenage mutant ninja turtle over here. Perhaps the portrait of um, uh, Plato is actually uh, a, also a portrait of Leonardo back here. I'm not exactly sure now. This guy with, a, with his uh, round bald head but long hair off the sides and long white beard is very much like uh, port self portraits of Leonardo that we see. This portrait way over here off to the right hand side with all of these young guys kind of hanging out here. And he's just got his little face just peeking out in the middle here. That's a self-portrait of Raphael. Raphael worked himself into this um, kind of pantheon of great thinkers and artists in, in this thing. So uh, I thought I was, you know, when you take an art history class, you kind of get this painting explained to you and then you see all of these little wonderful uh, Easter eggs hidden inside the painting, which are really cool. But basically this was supposed to be a discussion of one point linear perspective for us so that we can see how all of this works in linear perspective in a um, uh, combined, concentrated, consistent way in the composition. And so now I can come back to you guys. Uh, here we go. Okay, so we're, I'm done with that. Whew. We're we're not going to do a project uh, using linear perspective and atmospheric perspective combined. We're going to move right on to crazy color starting on Wednesday. Um, but I would like you guys to look at chapter eight and read about the different kinds of perspective, linear perspective and atmospheric perspective um, doc talked about, documented in chapter eight. It's a great starting point for your career as an artist, as a painter, and even as a photographer, videographer, understanding how you can play with space and spatial relationships three-dimensionally um, through the lens or on a canvas. And so that can help you very much as a, um, as a designer. Uh, so look at chapter eight, familiarize yourself, especially with atmospheric perspective and linear perspective. Uh, there will be like three or four questions about one point, two point and um, atmospheric perspective in our 20 question multiple choice quiz at the end of the quarter. I'm going, to, I'm going to wrap it up now. If there's any questions, please unmute your mic as quickly as possible and squeeze that question in before I get carried away and break us up for the day. But otherwise, um, go ahead and take a look at chapter eight. 
um, read it through once and just be amazed at the different kinds of perspective. In the 21st century, we're dealing with even three point or more kinds of linear perspective when dealing with um, very challenging kinds of uh, landscapes and space scapes um, as we, you know, stretch our imaginations to the very limit in terms of spatial relationships in a painting or drawing. Uh, for now, that's going to do it for me. I will see you guys again on Wednesday. And so until Wednesday, uh, have a good middle part of your week. Bye-bye.